Welcome back, guys. This is part 15 of Complex PTSD from Surviving to Thriving by Mr. Peter Walker. So let's take a moment to be here together now. We're here to look at our past, not to ignore it, not to be oblivious of it, not to be ignorant of it. We're here to look at it. Why? Because whatever life situation you have going right now, whatever feelings you're grappling with or are at peace with come from and directly from all those patterns and behaviors and thoughts and beliefs and just muscle memory that comes from your past. So we're here to look at the past so that it no longer dictates our future. So that we can get to know ourselves. Now if I start sweating up in here, it's because it's winter here in Crestone. And I have a gorgeous, beautiful wooden stove. And as a Southern California native, <laughs> I'm still learning how much wood to put in there before I make this place, this yurt, into a sweat lodge. Now, let's do a, a few, let's go with five more Instagram quotes that struck me. This one is from Dr. Joe Dispenza. Just as negative emotions can become embedded in the op operating system of our subconscious, so can positive ones. So what that means is that those triggers, once recognized, worked through, identified, categorized, unarmed, brought to the light, however you want to see it as, once that happens, there's still a void that needs to be filled. Otherwise, naturally, that old past, even when processed, will have nowhere else to go but its place that it's had for so long. Unless you replace it with something positive. And why wouldn't you? Don't you want your life to be more ease and excitement and joy filled? Okay, Mr. Dispenza. The next quote is from Alana Pratt. When you know yourself and stand in awareness and acceptance of all that you are, all that you are, you will have the upper hand in every situation. You'll become impossible to manipulate and move through life with a sense of ease. This be the goal, brothers and sisters. <laughs> now, some practical tools come from Bob Practor, lovely older gentleman that's been at this helping people out for his entire life. And these are his 10 habits you need to give up if you want to be productive. Now, there's many ways to do a thing. So this is just Mr. Bob Practors. And considering his uh, prestigious history, I thought it was worth noting. Number one, watching TV, TV, TV before going to bed. If you want to be productive, you're not supposed to do that. I'm guessing so that you'll have enough silence and chill time to, uh, Work on your own development. Create your own uh, life plans and goals. Two, spending a lot of time on your phone. Now, none of us do that. What are you talking? Uh, not working out. And by that, we don't mean life's not working out. I mean, you're not physically working out. Multitasking is apparently a bad thing. Now, I am uh, ADHD, 
No, <laughs> you say, yes, yes, I am. Um, comes from hypervigilance, as we've spoken about. But ultimately what that means is that in my personal experience, um, provided I have the correct medicines, and some of them were not that uh, helpful in the long run, <laughs> um, multitasking is a good thing for me. But not past three things at once. <laughs> So I'm not going against Mr. Bragter, I'm just giving my point of view. And now I see that this video camera is acting up, so hopefully this is recording properly. If not, sorry, I'll try a different camera tomorrow. Now, the other thing is striving for perfection. That can really jack up your uh, productivity because your ego gets all up in it and and all your codependency may get up all in it and then all of a sudden you're like no i must be perfect and everything must be done to the opting degree or i am a failure or i will be uh, considered a failure or worse uh they won't let me stay here <laughs> you know things like that um that's all stinky thinking and uh, as a former perfectionist um it's it's uh it's put me in a lot of workaholic uh long uh hard shifts uh and it's, it was all me trying to uh deal with those things that i just stated in regards to perfectionism so still working on it uh going with the flow what going with the flow you want to give up going with the flow if you want to be productive I don't think so but that's what it says there going with the flow i guess m maybe that means that have a goal have a plan uh, get a checklist <laughs> you know um create something purposeful in your day and actually achieve it trying to be productive during the whole day yeah that goes with like what i was saying with perfectionism don't do that don't beat yourself up and your body up and and not give yourself time to you know relax and and uh improve yourself in other ways other than busting your butt um you will ultimately hurt yourself your productivity and uh, your body uh probably your relationships too let's see doing every task by yourself fuck that seriously Teamwork makes the dream work. If you have any position in a team, your job is to figure out how to get the team to work together or how to have the team be working together or be part of that team excited to be working together so that, uh, yeah, you can be more productive and kinder to the entire team. Let's see, uh, being negative, why bother? It's just gonna exhaust you and make you not a shine bright light. <laughs> and then stressed and living in fear. Yeah, if you wanna be productive, get out of stress and get out of fear. Thank you, Mr. Bob Proctor. Uh, lastly, we have two, uh... oh, this camera, snap, now I'm frozen. Well, screw it, I'm continuing. This is from Law of Attraction 000 from Instagram, and it reads, and then it happened. Mm. And then it happened. One day you woke up, you wake up, and you're in this place. You're in this place where everything feels right. Your heart is calm, your soul is lit, your thoughts are positive, your vision is clear, you're at peace. At peace with where you've been, at peace with what you've been through, and at peace with where you're headed. This last one is called Love Fest. Fall truly, madly, deeply in love even if it doesn't even if it does not begin or end the way you expect ah uh, expectations will break your heart it's best to just trust your intuition and follow that good feeling 
Anything else will confuse you and may rat tail you into stress and fear. Our entire existence is made of love, made to love, and made for love. Denying love is like denying your need for oxygen. Yeah. Okay, now, moving on. We got cut off last time because my uh, other camera can't do no more than uh, 33 minutes, apparently, which is a nice number. Hey. But we left off with this paragraph. So I'll restart it and continue on. We're in chapter four. And thereof. Once again, I am certainly not knocking joy. Kitty. But when it is inauthentic, it is disconcertingly sad and sometimes alienating. In worst case scenarios, a controlling narcissist can emotionally blackmail us to join him in falsely emoting joy. Just as painful as when we codependents force ourselves to laugh to cover up our fear or our shame. Are you afraid you're not following your heart's desires, your, your truest keenest path to your highest self the hell does that mean your highest self one that just loves life and is in gratitude and and just knows that things are solid that there's no possibility of screwing anything up because the people involved are too busy striving to create and to push forward and push those limits and explore, (laughs) you know? Living, thriving. This is also not to say that authentic joy cannot be contagious. Contagious joy is the wonderful experience of being positively triggered into vicariously sharing someone else's authentic delight. Oh, it's one of my favorite things to do in the whole wide world. I did not realize uh, immediately that I had been blessed with this grace. It was a spiritual gift. I'm positive of it. And whoever prayed that into flourishing, thank you. And may you be blessed abundantly as well. Um, but yeah, when I'm in a good spot, oh, it is my absolute joy and delight to bring other people up. For an experience of this, go to www.youtube.com and search for quadruplets laughing. Oh, we'll have to do that. Let's see. In my experience, it seems that authentic joy is much more common in the lives of well-parented children. I also do not think that joy is typically as dominant and emotional. Whoa, Nelly. Okay. As our emotional, int- let's see, where were we? Uh, that's kind of harsh, right? Okay, here we go. Oh, snap. No, no. In my experience, it seems that authentic joy is much more common in the lives of well-parented children. I also do not think that joy is typically as dominant an emotional theme in adult life unless it is synthetically induced with drugs or alcohol. On the other hand, see, I paused right there because what allowed me to be as youthful or as flighty or as peppy or as uh, giddy or whatever, obnoxious, (laughs) whatever, whatever it is that when people see me in this high energy, what allowed that was actually not drugs and alcohol. It was my experience as a Christian in the, in the, in the church. And by that, I'm going to rephrase that in the word of God that I read and what I perceived and what the word of God showed me to be as a little child freed me to be in my delight 
and it, it I had to fight through all sorts of shame and and you know people would just oh once you're more aware you'll stop acting such a fool no no it was the word of God that actually helped me revel in my happiness and my giddiness as our emotional where is it da, 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 da. I keep missing my spot okay on the other hand experiences of joy for survivors can gradually become more frequent as a person's recovery efforts promote increasing feelings of safety in the world. What did that look like for me? Um, as a child, everything was sexualized, clearly, because I was being sexualized um, in a brutal way. Always uh, put down and, and made, uh, oh, the butt of the joke on top of being raped. So anything from what i saw on television to and the, my god the sexuality in every commercial show movie <laughs> we all know this um even god i can't even imagine now i feel i feel really bad for people now um but that's something that i can't speak on because i'm you know gonna be 42 so i know what i know as a 42 year old um but as a survivor as i was God, it took me deep into my 20s to, um, God, it really took me, <laughs> everything's so foggy back there. It, it took me a long time of, of life experience through theater, through seeing, um, you know, different groups of people coming and going together and, and experiencing uh, healthier and healthier relationships through theater, blah, 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 to, to really start seeing life not sexualized um and filthy and dirty and gross and oh my god um bad all bad decades it took you know 14 years of sexual abuse it took it took decades deep into my 20s to um to start really seeing things like sex as something beautiful and it was a conscious choice and i f fucking don't regret a second of it um as as difficult as it was I was just talking to a friend of mine who, um, I guess we're going there. Um, no, not right now. Uh, it took a lot to get sexuality to not be this filthy thing. And I'm really proud of that because it took a lot of work, conscious work, poetry writing. It took, it took a lot of different elements, um, to make it what it is, which is something beautiful and epic and blissful. Um, so alcohol and drugs didn't help me with that. They made that shit worse um, initially. In my, Because when I started using drugs, they expanded my mind and opened my world. But of course, with having the thoughts I had in my head, certain drugs just sexualized the hell out of me. This is why I don't do a lot of weed. It uh, has a very sexual effect on me. Um, not so much that lately. I've been using it uh, at work when I'm doing manual labor or painting and stuff. And I'm usually by myself there. So I just go into my thoughts. but um, Or into the art piece that I'm doing. But here it says survivals are gradually become more frequent. Where is it? Where did we leave off? Uh, induced with drugs or alcohol. On the other hand, experiences of joy for survivors can gradually become more frequent as a person's recovery efforts promote increased feelings of safety in the world. And like I just explained, my uh, safety steps were not pretty and they were not smooth and they took decades. So be aware of that. This is not us... Uh, sweeping anything under the rug this is going to take retraining conscious choices and practice until it becomes your new normal and it will it will allow your heart to lead and directly very specifically and, and, and very focusedly change your thoughts your mind your mind is not to be stronger than your heart your heart's to direct your mind you can't fuck up if you do that. Anything else left to the mind? You're talking about your environment, uh, your your everything around you, all the energy around you, all the 
things that don't even have anything to do with you will be affecting you. Especially now that the veil is so thin. So, God knows, you have to be able to go in to your heart chakra and base your intent out of there. If you don't know how to do that, um, let me know in the comments. I'll try to figure out a way to explain that. Although the easiest thing is being very silent. Slowing your breathing in and out of your nose. Allowing the space to come around you. And when you're actually at ease, which might take some time for you, ask the question. And when you hear a still small voice with perfect confidence, sometimes with seriousness, but sometimes with delight, but always very smooth and without push, you'll know that you know it's your intuition that's your holy spirit that's your connection with the all that we all are as one informing you of what you may have forgotten that you know and that's the voice you follow that's your heart that's your truth trust me on that as our emotional intelligence increases I see considerable evidence that our expectations of joy become more reasonable. <laughs> this allows us to let go of permanent happiness as the unrealistic goal of recovery. I got to tell you, since I got to Crestone and uh, here in Colorado, I had the, I ha I've had the longest stretches of fucking just good 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 days like what's going on i'm just feeling groovy so yeah they're trying to like forewarn you that you're not always going to be happy but here's what i'm i learned if you are within your sovereignty and you have enough self-love and you have enough boundaries set up which is what they're talking about you will have good days over bad most every day because you're here now and no one can fuck with you. You're unfuckable. Unfuck with the bull. There we go. Unfuck with the bull. Nobody can fuck with you. We're not talking sex here. <laughs> you, you, uh, I lost that recently, but it wasn't for very long. And I think I was, uh, it was, it was meant to, to teach me to stand up for my, for myself and to also be able to see within the situation what i was doing to contribute it which is overworking because my desire to uh show how much i care i guess hmm. sometimes it'd be like that <laughs> as our emotional intelligence increases I see considerable evidence that our expectations of joy become more reasonable. Hmm. This allows us to let go of permanent happiness as the unrealistic goal of recovery. Until this happens, we remain at the mercy of the critics' contemptuous diatribes that we are not being joyful enough. Yeah, fuck that. I vaguely recall what this part of the book is talking about. Um, I do having to uh, chide myself because I wasn't being uh, optimistic enough and having enough faith to know everything was going to be okay. Except eventually, by being positive and being in um, in action towards my positive goals, and those usually start with the basics of you know having a place to live and food and having heat or whatever and progress forward into um, like where I'm at now, which is uh, I have a new career that I'm training for. I mean, that's pretty epic. And that happens by, again, work, focus, persistence, pushing yourself forward, not allowing yourself to get distracted to the point that you derail. 
And if you feel bad, make an appointment with yourself or a good friend if you're lucky to have good friends and, and talk it out. But don't over talk it out because if you over talk it out, you're giving it too much energy and it's like you're feeding that monster to grow more. This allows us to let go of permanent happiness as the unrealistic goal of recovery. Until this happens, we remain at the mercy of the critics' contemptuous diet tribes that we are not being joyful enough. One of my clients recently became mindful enough to see how he was shaming himself for not being as jubilant as those in the beer commercials. Those are actors. <laughs> and they spent hours and hours on set and had a whole crew around them with makeup and hair and costumes and lighting and blah, blah, blah. No, that, that shit ain't real. That shit is constructed. Um, not ditching it, dissing it. I'm an actor. I, 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 as an actor in the scene, I know that the type of actor I am, I'm going to give it my most authentic self. But it's still going to be like not real when I have a full crew like that around me and a director and a producer and a writer and everything else. So, yeah, don't look at TV. OK, I recently shot a gun for the real realistically for the first time where I had a, a lady trainer teaching me how to shoot it, how to aim it, how to stand. I could not have been more blown away after all the freaking cop shows I've seen just how completely off every TV show I've ever seen was to how you actually shoot a gun. So yeah, don't look at the world of entertainment uh, as a whole, you know, mass consumption wise, um, to look at your life, okay? When I was growing up, the Cosby's was like huge. Family ties was huge. And uh, nothing at all like my life. I just remember it made me feel sad. So yeah, don't look at TV for your... Yeah, don't do that. Just don't. Progress in recovery is seen. This is being barely near. Where were we? You know what happens every time I look up? I think I just keep pushing too much page flipping over here. Oh, shit. Oops, I did. I went quite a bit ahead. Okay, progress... Conditions be ranges from mild neurosis to psychosis. Whoa, nearly. Okay, there we are. Not being as jubilant as those in the beer commercials. Thank you for your patience. I really hope with as much as I'm seeing this thing get stuck that this is actually a recording. As a concluding comment to this overview, it is important to emphasize that, like most things in life, there are degrees of complex PTSD. The continuum of complex PTSD ranges from mild neurosis to psychosis. Neurosis mean, mean an emotional illness and psychosis mean, mean a very serious mental illness. The difference between getting triggered and crying about it three days later after feeling uncomfortable for a while going, what is this that's coming up? And then just going, oh, I'm remembering the past very prominently because this person that I hadn't even really focused on for years all of a sudden has become a, a, a point of focus because of this new thing that's happening today. That's the type of thing that will make something from the past very real in the present and it might be discombobulating and then you will have this moments, days where it will discombobulate you and then boom, you'll realize it, probably cry or get a little scared and then process it and be fine. When I look back at how I used to be just fucking four or five years ago in regards to us, us my abuser, um, God, June 15th, uh, 2017, the hardest day of my, of my life. Um, I hadn't really processed that day very much and I had to process it recently because of a very good reason. Um, that came back into my life. Uh, that was four years and seven uh, months later that I got uh, the opportunity to deal with that day and what happened. And uh, it took three days of feeling really, really uh, uh, 
huge foray of emotions to process that and, and recognize that, that I still had so much fear still there. Smartly, with reason. And so the fact that I can even sit here right now and talk about it, because this just happened recently, like within this month of 2022, January here. Um, I can still feel the emotions that come up and um, I can feel them on my face. I can, I can feel them in my joints. I can uh, certainly feel it in my back. It's like a fucking wrought iron. Even though it came with all this good news, I, I still had to realize, oh shit, all that's still there, just waiting um, to not be ignored because eventually my goal is to, if I ever see my abuser again, is to not freeze. Pretty simple goal. But if I wasn't doing the work I was doing, if you weren't doing the work you're doing, if you don't do any work with your past traumas, past trauma may waltz into your world even amidst incredible good news and remind you that it could still bitch slap you around and make you uh, go into psychosis here I didn't have to go into psychosis but I certainly was on top of that rim when this came up this month the past doesn't go anywhere you have to face it until it no longer makes you run away or freeze or fight or fawn. And you can look at it as an, an, as an adult, a sovereign adult and go, no, I can control my reaction here because I'm no longer a child. I am no longer in denial. I am no longer in fear. I'm no longer surviving. So this neurosis to psychosis thing important it could save your life it could literally save your life to not freeze when your abuser comes into your if your abuser comes into your world that ain't no joke that's important it could save your life or you could save others because as healers, we need to know, and if you are a healer or plan to be one, know that the only way you're going to be a successful healer is by healing thyself. Because unless you actually know and experience horrible shit, how are you going to help anybody that experienced the same levels or close to levels of horrible shit? Only if you heal yourself first. Its severity ranges from having extended periods without flashbacks to being in full flashback horror much of the time. This range also varies from a condition of increased experiences of thriving to a condition of barely surviving disability. Exactly what I just spoke about. Exactly. Progress in recovery is seen. Oh, damn, this thing is completely frozen now. Once again at 33 fucking minutes. And this is a completely different phone. So apparently, I got two more paragraphs. Fuck it, I'm going proceeding ahead. Progress in recovery is seen then in flashbacks becoming more manageable and life satisfaction becoming continuously more frequent. A friend of mine once joked with me, I've got so much recovery, I'm beyond normal. I'm super normal. <sighs> I made the normies look like they're the ones with complex PTSD. <laughs> I want that on a t-shirt. All right. As we end the overview, we are ready to move to the next chapter, which explains how varying childhood trauma histories can cause complex PTSD. Here we will also see how verbal and emotional abuse alone can cause complex PTSD. And I want to repeat that. Here we will also see how verbal and emotional abuse alone can cause complex PTSD and how profound emotional abandonment is typically 
at the core of most complex PTSD. Because if you had had a parent that was there for you, focused on you, took the time all the time to be there and get to know you and be there for you and contribute to you and, and instruct you. And if you had one human being that gave a fuck consciously from the heart, I don't see how complex PTSD would be something you would have to deal with. Because if a person loves you enough as a child, because as an adult, fuck, it, it's, it's up to the person to heal themselves and allow the support of others to contribute. But you can't heal anybody other than yourself. And by your example, be that light for other people. And if your light starts to get dimmed out when you are trying to help others, or, or remember, it's not your job to help others. Your kids, sure. Any child, sure. But as, an, as adults, remember your sovereignty. And by showing your sovereignty, that will attract the type of person, people, situations, circumstances that will jive with your vibe. Life 